Who is going to take care of the wives? Why God created us? What is cosmic energy? The religion is the solution for the things happening all around the world. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim. Jihad basically means to strive to struggle. The Hindus and the Muslims will be united. He is not cosmic energy. He is more superior than that. Quran gives you the solution to the problems of humankind. Not that we shall despise each other. That according to Japan, India will be the superpower of the world. We will be a superpower. We will be far superior to the Americans. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آسن قال من من دعي لله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين رب شلي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لسان يفقه قولي I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. You are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or the propagation of Islam. So there are any questions among the brothers, they are most welcome. Yes, brother. Uh, brother, this is regarding uh, divisions in Ummah, sex in Ummah. Uh, one of my friend quoted one of the letters of Prophet Muhammad. He is written to non-Muslim, which specifies that whenever the message is reaches to any uh, people, he has become Ummah of that Prophet. So according to that letter, he is telling that the whole people after the Prophet Muhammad all become the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad So the divisions which is going to be take place, the 73 sects, which should be including all people, not only Muslims. So what is your opinion on that? That was the question. He's quoting Hadith. That whenever a message, what Muhammad has said or proclaimed, if it reaches any human being, he becomes the Ummah of Muhammad So when we're talking about sex, we're talking only amongst the Muslims, it should be amongst all human beings put together. So there are two ways of analyzing this uh, hadith. One thing is that when I tell a person that I say, brother, what's the question? So you hear the brother I'm talking about is brother in humanity. As a human being, we are brothers. In the other aspect, there is another thing called as brother in faith. The same way here, Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you're talking about the Muslim Ummah, then it's restricted to only the Muslims after the message has reached of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they have accepted it, that person is the Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the context of Islam. Otherwise, in the broader context, Ummah means the last and final message of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He came for the whole of humanity. So the whole of humanity is the Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The same way as I mentioned that you are my brother, one is brother in humanity, one is brother in faith. Same way Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ummah in faith and Ummah in humanity. So in this context, Muhammad did not come only for the Muslims or for the Arabs, as I mentioned in my talk. He came for the whole of humanity. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, Wama illa rahmatil alameen, that we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humanity, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to all the worlds. Allah repeats the message in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28, that that we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger. So in this context, if you say Ummah, means to whom the message was given, yes. Then the whole humanity is Ummah and everyone should follow the message of Allah and His Rasul. But in context of those who have accepted the message, then only the Muslims are the Ummah of Muhammad In larger context in humanity, all the people who came after Muhammad they are the Ummah. So in this context, we have to realize that in which context it is. So according to the Quran, whole of humanity should be one. And there are various verses talking about that. For example, Allah says in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, Ya ayyuha nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shu'uba wa kaba'a ila li ta'arifu inna karmakum inda Allah yatkaakum inna Allah alimun khabir O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you may recognize each other, not that you may despise each other and the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa So in this context, the whole of humanity is one ummah Hope that answers the question that's what he told next that uh, when Muhammad Rasan said my ummah will be divided in 73 sect. So why are you restricting to my ummah to only Muslims? Now here now he's asking another question. He's quoting one hadith and then getting another hadith. What he's quoting is the hadith of Tirmidhi, he another hadith. That my ummah is divided into 73 sect. Now here when he's saying my ummah, in context it refers only to the Muslim ummah, not ummah in humanity. 
So if you know the hadith, similarly when the Quran says about brothers, one is brothers in faith, he lives in Amunu, those who believe, and Yayo Nas, whole humankind. So in this context, because we know the context, we come to know that the second hadith that my Ummah will be divided 76 doesn't refer to the whole of humanity. It refers only to the Muslim Ummah in particular who have accepted the message of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hope that answers the question. Any sisters have any questions? Uh, brother, how to do dawa with atheist? Sister has a question that how to do dawa with atheist. And as I always mention, that one of the master keys for dawa in the Quran is Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says, Ta'ala ila kalmitin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. So normally people think that this can only be used with those people who belong to a religion, whether he may be a Christian or a Hindu or a Parsi or a Buddhist. But I call it a master key. Master key means opening all locks, not some of the locks or most of the locks. So in this context, if you hear this verse of the Quran, it speaks about let us come to common term between you and us. And it continues, which is the first term? Allah na illallah, that you worship none but Allah. Now, what commonalities can a Muslim find with an atheist? But whenever I meet an atheist, the first thing I do is I congratulate him. The reason I congratulate him is because most of the other non-Muslims, they are blindly following their parents. He is a Christian, because parents are Christian. He is a Hindu, parents are Hindu. Many Muslims are Muslim because the parents are Muslims. Now this atheist is thinking. His parents may be coming from a religious family, but he may not agree what the parents are saying that so-and-so person is God, and this God can get hurt, and he can get into trouble. So he doesn't agree. He is disagreeing with his parents. I congratulate him because he's not blindly following his parents. And the reason I congratulate him is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha, that there's no God. Only thing I have to do is Allah, the but Allah which I shall do, inshallah. So this atheist has already accepted and agreed with the first part of the Islamic Shahada, Islamic creed, La ilaha, there is no God. With the other non-Muslims, they are already believing in a God which is wrong. So first I have to deprogram them. I have to prove to them that the God they are worshipping is wrong and then tell them about the true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the atheist, half my job is already done. That is the reason I congratulate him. Only thing I have to do is the second half, illa Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. And I've given the talk, is the Quran God's word, in which I've proved at length that the Quran is the word of God and about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to an atheist also. The first question I will ask an atheist is that suppose an object, an equipment, which no one in the world has ever seen, and if it is bought in front of you, and if the question is asked that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this new object, of this new equipment, who no one has seen, what can he answer? If you ask any theist who's your friend, that there's an equipment, there's an object who no one in the world has seen, and is bought in front of you, who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this object? What answer can he give you? Creator, some may say manufacturer, some will say maker, some will say producer. Whatever the answer the atheist will give, it will be somewhat similar, either creator, manufacturer, maker, producer, inventor, somewhat similar. Just keep that answer at the back of the mind. Then ask him the question that how did our universe come into existence? And most of these atheists, they believe in science. They believe that science and technology has advanced. That's the reason we don't have to believe in God. Most of them. When we ask them this question that how did our universe come into existence? So he will tell you, that a few decades earlier, there were a group of scientists who described how the universe come into existence. And he will tell you that initially there was one primary nebula. The whole universe was one primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation. There was a big bang, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the sun, and the earth on which we live. This, they call it as the big bang. And when you ask the atheist, when did you come to know? He will tell you 30 years back, 40 years back. You tell him 
that this thing is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, which says, Avalam yaral lazina kafaru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. That the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clothed them asunder. Now this thing what you're talking about, the Big Bang, is mentioned in the Quran in a nutshell 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago? So he will tell you, maybe it's a flock. Don't argue with him. Continue. He ponders. How can you prove that 9-11 was an inside job? They used a term called lunatic fringe. He explores. Soha made a comment. Shah Rukh Khan made a comment. This is regarding Kabir Khan. He scrutinizes. I am a Muslim. First, a Muslim a female said, majority of the Muslims, but I reject all the rituals of Islam. That I wear a hijab are represented by the so-called moderate Muslims or not practicing. But Islam is in my culture. But there is so much of media deceiving. He unfolds. I would like to have your comments. So I just wanted to ask. What's your comment on that? So I would like you to comment on this. Comment on this. Me. Dr. Zankir Naik, who exposes the truth. So when you see a TV talk show, you have to keep in mind that what is the integrity and the intention of the producer and the moderator. Because if you doubt the intention of the producer and the moderator and the integrity, what you see finally on the television, in the TV talk show or the panel discussion, can be edited. Watch TV talk shows and analysis in Crossfire. This Thursday at 8.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 9.30 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Surely, my prayer, my sacrifice, my life, and my death are all for Allah, sustainer of the world. Watch Little Wonders at their best in The Wonder Kids, next on Peace TV. Most of these atheists, they believe in science. They believe that science and technology has advanced. That's the reason we don't have to believe in God. Most of them. When we ask them this question, that how did our universe come into existence? So he will tell you that a few decades earlier, there were a group of scientists who described how did the universe come into existence. And he will tell you that initially there was one primary nebula. The whole universe was one primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation. There was a big bang, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the sun, and the earth on which we live. This, they call it as the Big Bang. And when you ask the atheist, when did you come to know? He will tell you 30 years back, 40 years back. You tell him that this thing is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, which says, Avalam yaral lazina kafaru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaan adarat kan flakna huma. That the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clothed them asunder. Now this thing what you're talking about, the Big Bang, is mentioned in the Quran in a nutshell 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago? So he will tell you, maybe it's a flock. Don't argue with him. Continue. You ask him the question, that what is the shape of the earth on which we live? So he will tell you, the earth is spherical in shape. And when you ask him, when did you come to know that the earth was spherical? He will tell you, the first person who proved that the earth was spherical was Sir Francis Drake in 1577 when he sailed around the earth. You tell him that the Quran mentioned in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, and thereafter we have made the earth X shape. The Arabic word dahaha, one of its meanings is an expanse, and the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the word duya, which means an egg. And we know today 
that the earth on which we live is not completely round like a ball. It is flattened from the pole. It is geospherical in shape. And the Arabic word dahaha doesn't refer to a normal egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if we analyze and observe, the egg of an ostrich is geospherical in shape. Imagine the glorious Quran mentions 1400 years ago that the shape of the earth is geospherical. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? So the atheist may say that, oh, your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he may be an intelligent man. Maybe he was an expert, he was intelligent. Don't argue with him. Continue. Then we ask him the next question, that the light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? So he will tell you that previously, we human beings, we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. Yesterday, 100 years back, 200 years back, 300 years back, we came to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it is a reflected light. Quran mentions this 1400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61. That blessed is he who has made the constellations in the skies and placed therein sun having its own light and moon having borrowed light or reflected light. The Arabic word used for moonlight in the Quran is munir, meaning borrowed light, or nur, which means a reflection of light. Who could have mentioned in the Quran that the light of the moon was not its own light, but its reflected light or borrowed light 1400 years ago? So the atheist may give a pause and say that, fine, maybe your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was brilliant. Don't argue with him. Continue. Then you ask him the next question. That when I was in school, I had learned in geography and science that the sun, it did not rotate about its own axis. It revolved, but it did not rotate about its own axis. So they said, is that what I mentioned in the Quran? I said, no, that is what I learned in school in 1982. More than 24 years back when I was in school, I had learned that the sun did not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran mentions in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33. It is Allah who has created the night and the day. The sun and the moon. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. The Arabic word yasbuhun describes the motion of a moving body. And it says that the sun and the moon, besides revolving, it even rotates about its own axis. Which we did not know earlier. Today, with the help of an equipment, we can have the image of the sun on a tabletop. And we find that there are black spots and it takes approximately 25 days for these black spots to complete one rotation, indicating that the sun takes about 25 days to complete one rotation. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago? When I was in school, I had learned that the sun did not rotate about its own axis. So the atheist will give you a long pause. Don't wait for the reply. Continue. That it was one of the famous scientists of the century, Edwin Hubble, he said that our universe is expanding. He said it recently. Quran mentioned 1400 years ago in Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 47, that our universe is expanding. Quran, it speaks about water cycle. How does the water rise? Forms into clouds, moves into the interior, falls down as rain, and the water cycle is completed, which we did not know. What we learn in school, it was first described by Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580. Before that, we did not know about the water cycle. Quran mentions this water cycle in great detail 14 years ago, in several places. In Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 48 and 49. In Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. It's mentioned in Surah Jashia, chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 8 and 9. In Surah Mul, chapter number 67, verse number 30. In Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11. You can go on only quoting the references from the Quran which speak only about the water cycle. Who could have mentioned about the water cycle 1400 years ago? He will not reply. Don't wait for the answer. Continue. The Quran speaks about biology. That every living creature is made from water. In Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, which we did not know at that time. Quran speaks about geology. That the mountains have got stakes, pegs. They have got roots. In Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 67, which we did not know at that time. Quran speaks about oceanology. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53. And Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 19. That we have created two bodies of flowing water. One sweet and palatable and the other salt and bitter. 
Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. We knew previously there were two types of water, salty and sweet, but we did not know that there was a barrier and they did not mix, which we came to know recently. Quran speaks about zoology. In Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38, that all living creatures, all the animals, all the birds live in community like the human beings. Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the bee in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69. Quran speaks about the production of milk and about the blood circulation in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 66. Quran speaks about various stages of embryology in Surah Minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14. You can go on and on and after every scientific aspect, every scientific sign mentioned in the Quran, if you ask the atheist, that who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago? And there are more than 6,000 verses in the Quran, out of which more than 1,000 speak about science. After every scientific verse, if you ask the atheist, who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago, which we came to know recently, the only answer I can give you is the creator, the manufacturer, the producer, the inventor. This manufacturer, this producer, this inventor, this creator, we Muslims call as Allah. So with the help of the Quran, we can prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And simultaneously we prove that this Quran is the last and final revelation of this almighty God, the creator. In this way, we can prove to an atheist about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about Islam. For more details, you can refer to my video cassette is the Quran God's word, which is approximately for four hours. Hope that answers the question, sister. And brother, have any question? Yes, brother. What is the exact belief of the Buddhist? Uh, how, what are they in one God they are believing or not? Brother, the question: What are the teachings of Buddhism? Do they believe in one God? That's what the question is. As far as Buddhism is concerned, if you read the teachings of Buddha, Buddha did not comment on God. Buddhism is an agnostic religion. Agnostic means neither does the person believe in God, neither does he deny God. The person who believes in God is called theist. Person who does not believe in God is called an atheist. But a person who's quiet, is silent on the existence of God, neither does he say there is God, neither does he say there is no God, he's called an agnostic. And Buddhism is an agnostic religion. And the scholars of Buddhism, they say, that Buddha did not comment on God because when he came, polytheism was very much prevalent. And he thought that if he spoke about the oneness of Almighty God, people would not accept him. That is the reason he was silent. Neither did he say there was God, neither did he say there was no God. So he was quiet. But the scholars say that actually he believed in one God, but did not preach it because people would not agree with his teachings. This is the basis of Buddhism. And as far as the basic teachings are concerned, Buddha spoke about the four great truths. The first great truth was, there is sorrow and misery in this world. Second great truth, the cause of sorrow and misery is desire. Third great truth, sorrow and misery can be removed by removing desire. And the fourth great truth was, desire can be removed by following the eightfold path. And the eightfold part is do not tell a lie, do not rob, many of which are same as the teachings of Islam. But if we analyze the four great truths of Buddha, the first one says there is misery and sorrow in this world. There's no problem in accepting that. Point number two, the cause of sorrow and misery is desire. No problem with that. The third says that sorrow and misery can be removed by removing desire. Okay. And the last one says that desire can be removed by following the eightfold parts. Now, if you follow all these four truths, if we analyze the last two truths, they're contradicting. The third truth says that sorrow and misery can be removed by removing desire. And the fourth one says that desire can be removed by following the eightfold path. Now, once we follow the third great truth, that sorrow and misery can be removed by removing desire. Now, once we remove desire, the fourth great truth says that desire can be removed by following the eightfold parts. To follow the eightfold parts, you should have a desire. 
So the moment you have a desire to follow its full part, where is the question of removing desire? So it's contradicting. If you analyze it with logic, the third grade source says that sorrow and misery can be removed by removing desire. Okay, fine, we remove desire. Desire can be removed by following the eightfold parts. And to follow the eightfold parts, you should have a desire. So you have to have a desire to remove desire. It is contradicting. So therefore, if we analyze analytically, logically, these four great truths cannot stand on its own. But many of the teachings of Buddha match with Islam. What matches, we agree. Come to common terms as we now send you. Buddha even prophesied the coming of the last and final messenger, the Maitri. And I've given a talk in the various world religious scriptures. And there I've described in detail about he saying that there's a Maitri to come. And the Maitri, what he mentions, refers to no one but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hope that answers the question. Waakhra dawan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alamin. Ya Rabbu, innaka anta salam. Minka salam, ilayka salam. Ya Rabbu, innaka anta salam. Minka salam, ilayka salam. Li amrika yarjiu amru al-anam. Bayna yadayka qulubu al-anam. Li amrika yarjiu amru al-anam. Bayna yadayka qulubu al-anam.